Okay, so uh, welcome everyone to this special um, session in the Shannon channel. So today is special because I have uh, five speakers and we managed all of us to agree on a good timing to give uh, talks on a, um, on a theme that uh, we want it to be a kind of an interdisciplinary theme between coding theory and optimization. Uh, and then we will have uh, uh, five talks uh, on this theme. So we may take a break uh, after three talks, but we will see. So uh, the first talk is, uh, uh, is by Jamie Haddock and it's on stochastic gradient descent methods for corrupted systems of linear systems. Thank you, Jamie. Great, thank you. Um, okay. So, uh, oops, let me go back up. Um, first of all, thanks to the organizers for um, converting this so quickly to a virtual format. Um, I'm excited to be speaking and to, especially to hear some more talks. And um, I think the first opportunity to give a talk while I'm wearing slippers. So that's really exciting. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so I'm gonna talk today about some variants of stochastic gradient descent that we're using to solve systems of linear equations, which have really large scale and arbitrary um, number of uh, corruptions. So the problem we're considering here is to solve an overdetermined system of equations, AX equals B, um, but where some of the entries are, of B are not trustworthy, they've been arbitrarily corrupted. Um, here we're considering this, the scenario where we have a very, very tall skinny matrix, it's highly overdetermined. Um, and so these corruptions, while um, you know, important and, and a challenge, are not devastating to being able to uh, locate the solution to the ideal system of equations. Um, so let me just set up a little bit of notation. So we're going to imagine A here to be an M by N matrix with M much, much larger than N. And we'll consider just for simplicity, the scenario in which all of the matrix, uh, the, all of the rows of the matrix have a unit norm. So they've been normalized. Um, and we're seeking in this case, a, a solution X star, which we're going to denote the pseudo solution. Um, that would be the solution to the uncorrupted or ideal system of equations. Um, so here we're imagining that we have some kind of collection of um, uh, corruptions held in this sparse vector B sub C. It's going to have at most beta times M non-zero entries. So that means beta is going to be the fraction of the corrupted entries. And our problem really then is that given knowledge of the matrix A and the corrupted measurements, um, we'd like to design an algorithm which will recover the pseudo solution and do so efficiently. And specifically, we're interested in using variants of row action methods like randomized Kashmars or SGD, which are gonna use individual rows of the matrix A. We denote these A sub I transpose. Okay, and one question which we'll at least give some partial answers to is for which matrices can we obtain such a guarantee? Okay, so um, I'm gonna talk about the first approach, which is going to be a variant of the random Kashmars method. It's likely I don't need to go through describing what the randomized Kashmars method is, but um, just in case uh, as a refresher, it's an iterative method which produces better and a be better approximations to the solution uh, of a system, consistent system of equations um, where the updates are produced by taking the previous update and orthogonally projecting onto the hyperplane solution space to, a, to an equation sampled from the system of equations at random. Okay, and you just do this over and over again. And um, for a consistent system of equations, you're guaranteed um, that you'll converge to the solution. So each of the index it, and indices in your uh, system of equations corresponds to a hyperplane. And RK is just projecting orthogonally onto these randomly chosen hyperplanes. And it's known that RK has good convergence properties when the uh, system of equations is consistent and the matrix A is uh, decently conditioned. Um, but one unfortunate truth is that randomized Kashmars, as I've stated it, would handle corruptions very poorly. So I'll go through a couple of kind of pictorial examples. So if we had a consistent system of equations, randomized Kashmars, of course, is um, just updating iterates by sampling hyperplanes and then orthogonally projecting onto them. And so it's easy to see that you're going to be getting closer to the system, uh, to the solution um, with every step of the iterations, <clears throat> okay? However, 
when, oh, excuse me, um, let me just say also, so um, there's a nice convergence rate known uh, for this method. So in the case when the system of equations is consistent and we use a probability distribution over the indices of um, the rows, which has probabilities proportional to the squared norm um, of the row, um, then the iterates are gonna converge linearly in expectation. And so here the um, expected error the expected squared error is decreasing as a geometric sequence with this nice convergence constant, which depends upon uh, the scaled condition number of your matrix A. Okay, however, like I said, unfortunately, this approach is for consistent systems of equations. And so it doesn't handle the corruptions. In fact, the corruptions are devastating to the behavior of this algorithm. So here's a little simple example, which you know anyone can imagine their own versions. Um, in which you see that just the single step which um, selects one of the corrupted equations, um, you lose almost all of the progress that you've made in previous iterations, bringing you towards the solution. Okay, and here's a, a just empirical example. Um, what you're looking at on the y-axis here is the squared error of um, the randomized Kazmaier's iterates over many iterations of a run. Um, on a 50,000 by 100 Gaussian system, but in which a thousand of the measurements have been corrupted. And you can see, of course, you know, these spikes are occurring when we sample one of the uh, corrupted equations and we just lose all of the um, previous uh, gains or even more. Okay, so um, the general idea of the methods that we're thinking about are um, to try to avoid making projections that pull us too far away from the um, solution uh, that kind of damage all of the progress that we've made. Uh, and in particular, the first method I'll talk about um, is just going to try to avoid those projections by not projecting if the sampled hyperplane seems to be corrupted. Um, and so the idea is if you consider the set of all of the distances from the current iterate to the hyperplanes, if the sample distance that you've, you've sampled is you know, unusually large compared to the distribution of distances, then you just shouldn't project onto that hyperplane. Okay, and to quantify that, we're not going to project if this sample distance is larger than the median of all of the distances. And there's really, there's nothing too special about the median. Other quantiles are possible, they're likely better um, depending upon the, the fraction of corruptions that are in your system. And uh, for efficiency, it's often useful, instead of comparing um, your sample distance to the median of all of the distances of the hyperplanes, to instead subsample a collection of those rows and compare your sample to the median of just the subsampled number of distances. Uh, Jamie, I have a quick, very quick question. So yeah, absolutely. if you determine that the distance is big, do you discard that equation because it's corrupted or you keep it? No, we, we keep it so we can resample it. Um, but likely if it was already too large, you know, as you were kind of far away, if you've gotten closer, it's just going to remain very large. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so the, the um, uh, pseudocode for the method we're proposing is given here. So um, generically what this is doing is it's sampling some of the rows of your equation. Those are going to be um, the distances that you're going to compare to. You sample a single iterate, uh, excuse me, a single index, and you compare the residual or the distance associated to that single um, entry of the residual to the median of the entries of the residual from the sequence um, I1 through IT residual entries that you've also sampled. And if it happens to be lower than that median, then you're going to take that RK projection. Otherwise, you're just going to sit in place and not accept the RK projection. Okay, and um, we're able to pr prove a convergence result, um, at least in the case um, in which A is a matrix which, which has rows sampled uniformly over the sphere. And in that case, we, with some high probability, um, and assuming that the median RK algorithm is not subsampling, it's using the full um, number of rows, um, then we can prove a uh, convergence rate, a linear convergence rate in expectation. Okay, and a couple of other technical assumptions, we need that the fraction of corruptions beta is smaller than some fixed positive constant, 
and we need that n and the ratio m over n are sufficiently large. Okay, so if all of those are satisfied, even if this small fraction of um, corruptions are chosen adversarially, so placed adversarially and chosen to have values adversarially, um, this will still converge uh, because we'll be avoiding those, um, th those selected corrupted, high, uh, corrupted equations with high probability. Okay, so um, kind of the summary is that if A has incoherent rows, then the convergence bound for RK holds up to some constants, even in the case of adversarial corruption. Um, this result essentially holds with subsampling, although there's some kind of technical um, things that we have to handle, um, so I didn't present that result. And this can be generalized to other notions of incoherent rows. Um, generally, we can uh, handle some uh, types of sub-Gaussian uh, distributions on A and not just uniform over uh, the sphere. Okay, and there's three steps basically to this proof. Um, the first one is we need to show that this median is well concentrated around the distance to the, to a, excuse me, a, a scaled version of the distance to the pseudo solution for all points in Rn. Um, once we have that, we do two steps. We condition on choosing a good row and show that these good rows are going to make a fairly helpful contribution um, in expectation. We're gonna get closer to the solution. And then we condition also on choosing a corrupted row or bad row and we just show that this projection isn't going to hurt too much, basically because the median can't have gone too far away from uh, this distance that we have concentration at. Okay, so let me show you some, again, empirical experiments. So again, on the y-axis is the error, the squared error. Um, over many iterations of randomized Kashmir's methods, um, on a 50,000 by 100 Gaussian system with, again, 1,000 corruptions, so of course the green curve, the randomized Kashmir's curve, it's you know, not gonna converge, there's no hope. Um, however, the median approach is converging. You can see that there are a few little bumps where we are actually sampling one of the corrupted equations, um, but it's, uh, these bumps are not hurting us too much because they had to have been um, below the median of the distances. So they weren't pulling us too far. Okay. Um, an additional approach is instead of using randomized Kashmir's to use um, SGD. So um, under you know, some reasonable assumptions, um, recovering the solution, the pseudo solution to the system of equations is equivalent to just um, minimizing the number of non-zero entries of the residual. Of course, that's unfortunately NP-hard, so we move to solve the convex relaxation instead and minimize instead the one norm of the residual. And it's um, pretty classical work now of Candes and Tao and then Candes, Rudelson, Tao and Bershinen um, that the solutions to these problems will coincide exactly. And so um, our idea then is to use SGD with respect to this objective um, where um, we're taking again a step in the direction of um, the subgradient of this um, L1 objective uh, and we're gonna control the step size A to K using some statistic of uh, the entries of the residual. Okay, so uh, a quick little side note is that the optimal step size, um, if you're trying to make progress towards the pseudo solution um, for this L1 SGD step is uh, fairly easy to calculate. So you're trying to minimize the next residual, um, excuse me, the next error term, squared error term, um, and you can define this in terms of the previous squared error term, which allows you then to compute analytically um, this optimal step size A to K for this method. So it's, it's given by the expectation of uh, this term, the sign of the residual term times the error term inner product with that, that sampled row. Okay, and in that case, if you use that optimal step size, um, in expectation, you again get this um, uh, convergence where now the error terms um, are decreasing, hopefully, provided eta k star is um, positive, um, <clears throat> with uh, a constant that depends upon the current iterate. Okay, and um, 
this, you know, knowing this eta k star is of course, you know, uh, um, too much to hope for because that's the solution we desire. Um, but if you could approximate eta star to within a small constant factor, then you uh, can obtain a near optimal guarantee. And so this is what we're going to try to do. Um, we'll use a statistic of the residual that we're hoping approximates eta star. Um, and unsurprisingly, the statistic that we use is again, the median. Okay, so um, again, we're gonna sample a subset of um, rows and then we'll decide that the uh, step size we're going to use is just the median of the residuals associated to these rows. And then in this, this method, we always make the step. That step just uses the step size equal to the median of the sampled residual entries. Okay, and um, what we find um, empirically, so this is for a um, Gaussian system size 5,000 by 100 with 500 corruptions. And what we, we find empirically is that using this median statistic as the step size um, performs basically as well as using the un computable optimal step size, um, at least for this, this uh, scenario. Okay, so um, as long as the number of corruptions isn't too big, the median size seems to perform nearly optimally in practice. Okay, let me just um, wrap up with a, a few experiments. Um, so the first experiment, um, perhaps one question that might be kind of hanging around is, does the quantile choosing the median for median RK really matter that much? And the answer is no. Um, so this is for a 50,000 by 100 Gaussian system where we have 30% corrupted entries. I'm plotting the relative error versus iterations of a bunch of various methods um, which use different quantiles for whether to accept an RK iteration or not. So you can think of these um, orange and blue curves that are kind of way up near the top as being a very cautious version of this method where we're only accepting um, the step if the distance the step is going to make is less than 10% of all of the other um, residual entries or distances. Okay, and then as you move down, once you get to this yellow curve, this is a very brave version of this method, which is saying, I'm only, I'm going to accept, um, I'm only going to reject 10% of the um, sample distance, distances or residuals. Okay, and of course, what you're seeing is um, basically if we're choosing um, to accept um, no more than 70% of uh, the residual entries that we're getting um, uh, convergence, and that's because we're avoiding with high probability the 30% of corrupted entries um, that we put in the system. Okay, so we see something very similar for uh, median SGD. So here I'm, I'm plotting um, uh, just the L1 SGD method, which uses step size that selects the um, corresponding quantile of the residual entries. And um, here we see that only once we get up to 0 0.6 are we getting real, um, I guess maybe 0 0.5, we're getting some um, damage uh, from the 30% corrupted entries. Okay, and then the final experiment um, varies the size of the corruptions. Um, so this one's very, I think, um, interesting. Uh, it shows in fact that um, a large corruption size, so you know this kind of adversary has really thrown off the entries in the B vector um, corresponding to the corruptions, um, that really doesn't affect in any way the behavior of these methods. Um, because again, we're using the median, and so this is just really um, blowing up some of the entries of the residual that we were going to ignore anyway. Okay, so um, I'll finish with a few um, open uh, questions um, which deal with um, this method and the variants that we've discussed. Uh, so how, first, how does the analysis of median RK extend to matrices with correlated rows? So you know, uniform over the sphere is already a very nice scenario. Um, it, you know, we'd like to prove something that can handle a kind of significantly different distribution of matrices. Um, and then uh, the analysis that we use, so you, you notice in the theorem I presented that I didn't give the constants 
those constants come from um, a bunch of um, concentration inequalities and other um, results dealing with random matrices. Um, and so those constants tend to be pretty bad. And so we're hoping that there might be a better analysis which gives constants which actually match the empirical results, which are vastly different than if we actually use the constants. And then finally, um, we've been investigating versions of median RK which um, are, uh, which actually are greedy. They order the um, residual entries and they choose the residual entry, which is just above the known number of fraction, uh, fraction of constraints. Um, and we don't have any um, analysis for that type of method that justifies uh, the behavior that we're seeing in empirically, which is very, very strong. Okay, um, that's the end. Thank you again. Thanks a lot, Jamie. That was very interesting. Uh, I think we have time to take one question or maybe two quick questions. I don't know if any, anyone has a question. Uh, I have a question. Yep. Uh, so uh, I want to ask if this does connect to linear search method. And another question that, uh, what makes you think this way? What, what, from where the idea coming from choosing, like, does there is any previous work that's similar? with other algorithm to that? Yeah, um, okay, so I'm gonna on, answer the first question, which is I don't really know what you mean by a linear search method. Um, if you can easily say what it is, maybe I can, can answer. Like in linear search, we usually we drop like the samples that not gonna improve uh, the way to the optimal point. That's what we do usually. Okay. Um, I mean, it sounds very related. I, I, can't, I don't know. I don't have a, a better answer off the top of my head. Um, to answer your second question um, regarding kind of where did this idea come from? Um, so there has been some work um, previously um, more in the area of linear feasibility, um, which attempts to solve versions of the, the um, max feasible subset problem using these types of relaxation or projection methods. Um, I have some work with uh, Deanna Nidell um, where we used um, this, I kind of built upon those previous works and used the idea of um, kind of identifying corruptions by their residual, by the size of their residual entries and then actually doing kind of like Salim um, recommended or suggested and, and flagging those um, equations. We sort of, um, said, you know, if we keep seeing that those have large residual entries, then we're going to become more and more certain that those should be um, corrupted and should be discarded. Um, but this idea of using the median as the um, uh, kind of statistic for um, accepting the projections isn't something that I've seen elsewhere. Um, it's a good idea of my co-author, uh, William Swartworth. So. Okay, this is great. I mean, I think there's also some room for discussion how how is this result? Sorry, my time is over. But because I can see this as a as a, as a linear code, and then I'll be interested in, in seeing. But but we can discuss this later. So thanks a lot, Jamie. That was very interesting. Yeah. And we can move next for our next talk by GV, and it's gonna be I think it's related in the sense that it has also stochastic gradient. So it's gonna be about VQ SGD and GV. Do you hear? Yes. Okay, so okay. does it show my slides or? Yes, yes, yeah. Maybe if you make it full screen. Perfect. Um, okay, let me just, thanks again. Yeah, so first of all, like really, thank you so much for organizing this. And also thank you everyone for joining. So I will be talking about this uh, quantization schemes uh, to which reduces communication cost in stochastic gradient descent. And this was a joint work with uh, Raj, uh, Daniel Kane, and uh, Arya. Okay. Yeah, so consider the following scenario. Uh, so assume you have a bunch of uh, uh, users communicating uh, bunch of users who want to collaboratively train some uh, global machine learning model okay, without really having to share their private data. And uh, stochastic gradient descent is one widely used optimization subroutine uh, used to train these uh, 
large scale models. And it proceeds essentially in multiple iterations. And in every iteration, uh, you have two rounds. So in the first round, uh, basically every local node computes and sends a local est uh, unbiased estimate of the local gradient to a parameter server. And the parameter server on receiving these local gradients averages them and updates the model and broadcasts them. Okay. And it is well known that the convergence of any such uh, scheme uh, directly depends on the variance uh, of these unbiased estimates. And however, uh, if you note, like communicating each of these gradients requires the local machines to send about D floating point numbers each. And in the setting of uh, federated learning where the number of nodes are uh, really, really huge or in the high dimensional setting when these gradients lie in uh, really high dimensional space, that is D is very large. This communication cost forms a bottleneck to the convergence or the efficiency of uh, this entire uh, stochastic gradient descent scheme. So, the goal that we want to uh, achieve today is to reduce this communication cost to a given budget of C bits per local machine. And with respect to this budget, we want to understand what is the best convergence that we can obtain. Yeah. And this is, uh, so just to rephrase the problem, the goal here is to compute an unbiased estimate of a gradient that lies in a really high dimensional real space uh, that has only bits of representation and also has a bounded second moment. Okay, so this is the problem setting. So we want to compute this unbiased estimate. And we work with the assumption that all of these gradients have some bounded norm. And without loss of generality, just by scaling, we can assume this norm to be one, uh, at most one. Okay, so we want to quantize any gradient that uh, lies in this unit ball. And our entire scheme is based on the observation that any unbiased estimate that has this finite representation is just a convex combination of a finite set of points. Okay, so you can take a bunch of points and write any point within the unit ball as a convex combination of these gates, and that will give you an unbiased estimate. However, uh, there's, uh, there are many uh, moving parts here. We want to understand how many points do we uh, consider? How do you arrange these points in space? and also to understand the efficiency of computing the convex combinations. And understanding these uh, questions will help you understand the trade-offs that you can achieve between communication and the variance of this uh, uh, stochastic gradient descent. Okay. So this is not a new problem. So one of the seminal works here, uh, which was called QSGDs. So the way they quantize the gradients is by considering uh, a by covering this unit ball using uh, many uh, hypercubes or maybe hypergrids. Okay. So doing that, they achieve, uh, they get an unbiased uh, estimate of the gradient. And uh, they have a variance that ranges from square root D all the way up to, uh, that goes down all the way up to uh, just a constant uh, with communication that uh, increases from square root D all the way up to D indices in expectation. Okay, so as the communication increases, the variance decreases. Uh, that is what we know should happen. Uh, and then following this work, there were a series of works, all of which achieved various trade-offs. Uh, however, in all these works, uh, the communication that was needed was at least square root D indices. Okay, so these are not bits, square root D indices. And the main question that we tackle is like, can we do better? Like, can we get uh, communication below square root D as well. GV, I, I may have uh, missed something very quick. What is D here? Uh, D is the dimension in which all these oh, okay, okay. are. Yes. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, so we propose a, a very generic vector quantization scheme. Uh, so consider the unit ball. And in order to quantize any point within the unit ball, we uh, pick a set of uh, points. Let's say the point set is denoted by C and such that the convex hull of this point set contains the unit ball, okay? So given this uh, setup, any point within the unit ball can now be written as a convex linear combination of the vertices of this convex hull. And the quantization is essentially now uh, 
what it returns is just a vertex of this convex cell with probability proportional to the coefficient of this convex combination. Okay, so just by definition, this itself gives you an unbiased estimate. The variance here is now uh, dominated by the circumradius of this convex hull, which is the maximum squared norm of any of the points within the point set. And now to communicate one of these vertices, all you have to do is return, uh, send the index of this vertex with respect to some fixed ordering. Okay, so now the communication is just log of the size of this point set. So the number of points within the point set. Okay, so, uh, however, we don't know like, uh, so using different kinds of point sets, you can achieve different trade-offs okay, between the communication and the variance. And so what I'll uh, basically cover next is essentially how to construct these point sets and what are the trade-offs that we can achieve using different various uh, point sets. So first of all, we give a characterization of point sets that contain this unit, such that the convex cell contains this unit ball. Uh, so essentially uh, the convex cell of any point set will contain the unit ball if and only if for any point X on the unit sphere, there will exist at least one point from within the point set that will have a large inner product. Okay. Uh, so the inner product is at least one. So similarly, you take any point within on the unit sphere, there will always exist one point from within this point set C that will have inner product at least one. So this is a if and only if characterization and using this characterization, we can construct point sets that achieve various trade-offs between communication and the variance. So we show that there always exists a point set uh, uh, of cardinality two to the little c, such that the variance is uh, about d over c. Okay. And uh, the proof is pretty simple. Um, essentially what we do is we sample a large number of Gaussian points. By Gaussian points, I mean I sample two to the c points where every index of, uh, where every point has, uh, the sample using IID Gaussian uh, indices okay. uh, with certain variance. And the variance is chosen such that with high probability, the norm of each of these points is uh, bounded by R, which is about D over C. Now to show that the convex hull of these, uh, this point set, that is the point set with two to the C Gaussian points will contain the unit ball, we show that the characterization is satisfied. Uh, essentially, we show that if you pick any point on the unit sphere, there will exist one point from within this chosen point set that has large inner product. Uh, however, to do that, we need uh, some kind of lower bound on the tail of this uh, uh, inequality. And now when we do a union bound, we essentially cannot basically do a union bound over all the points on the unit sphere. So we just take a union bound over the epsilon net points. Okay, so an epsilon net is just a discrete set of points on the unit sphere such that any point of the unit sphere is at a distance of up, at most epsilon from one of these net points. Okay, so there are exponential number of net points. So basically what we want from the tail bound is to grow exponentially. And essentially Gaussian points allows us to achieve that. And using this set of uh, points, we get an unbiased estimate and the variance is about uh, D over C. And the communication that we need is log of cardinality, which is that of uh, little, that is exactly little C. Uh, how hard is it to find these, uh, this epsilon net, the complexity of it? Uh, yeah, so again, uh, so if this is kind of inefficient way of getting it. Uh, epsilon net work. Uh, yeah, so if you take any uh, covering code, that will give you an epsilon net. Uh, like you project uh, in front of the unit sphere. So one quick point, Salim. Uh, here, actually, this is just if we need the epsilon net for the proof, um, we really need to construct it, right? So okay. it doesn't really matter. We just want to show something. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so what this uh, random sampling uh, tells you is that we can achieve uh, the following trade-offs. That is communication times variance is about oddity. So for any C bits of communication, uh, you can achieve a variance which uh, goes as D over C. However, this is a randomized construction and one goal of this work is to understand can we get explicit constructions of uh, such point sets. 
Okay. So on one end of the spectrum, uh, you see that if you take any epsilon net, uh, and if you just scale this epsilon net by a tiny constant, that will satisfy the uh, constraint that uh, the convex hull will contain the unit ball. Okay, and this already gives you a non-biased estimate uh, that has a constant variance, and communication now is about uh, d bits. Okay, so uh, here the communication is large, but the variance is uh, the best we can. However, computing this convex combinations here with respect to these epsilon nets is uh, slightly computationally inefficient. So we look at another explicit construction. So this is based on Reed-Muller codes. So for this construction, let us assume the dimension is some power of two. And uh, now consider just the set of all code words of uh, Reed-Muller codes of degree one in L variables, okay? So, a reed muller code is of degree one is essentially evaluations of all linear polynomials over all the field elements of f2 to the l okay so it will so the code book will look something like this matrix here so the number of code words is about 2d that is 2 to the l plus 1 and each of these are evaluated over all the points in f2 to the l now, just by mapping these points from the binaries to the reals uh, using a simple BPL schema and just map zeros to minus one. So each row here of this matrix corresponds to a point of the point set that we, we will be taking. So each point has a squared norm of at most, uh, has squared norm D exactly. And this will give us an unbiased estimate, uh, which has a variance of order D. And since the number of uh, points in this point sets is exactly two times d, so the communication that we achieve is about log 2d. Okay. So this was a very simple construction. And also uh, computing these convex combinations is efficient because this is essentially a Hadamard matrix that you are uh, uh, doing a linear, that you're solving a linear system of equations on. Okay. So this is an efficient uh, way to construct. And now here you see the trade-offs is, uh, so for about log d bits of communication, you achieve a variance of d. And uh, what we see is that if you use any binary linear code instead of the reed muller codes, that will also achieve the same variance bounds. Uh, and with reed mullers this is the best communication we can uh, hope for. And one way of improving variance is just by using a repetition. So it, now you can start with a scheme uh, that has high variance, uh, but low communication, but you can uh, do a smooth trade-offs with, uh, by increasing the communication a bit, you can reduce the, keep reducing the variance. And the idea is a simple repetition scheme. So you can just apply the quantization scheme uh, independently some S times and take an average of it. So that will reduce the variance by a factor of S, but now communicating this average is a little tricky because the average does not lie within the point set. So you cannot simply send one particular index, but we can get away with it by sending S uh, different indices that you obtain by applying this quantization schemes S times independently. So that will increase the communication by a factor of S and the variance reduced by the same factor. Okay, so the product variance times communication still remains the same. So if you start with the previous scheme that is of the reed muller codes, uh, so initially, it, uh, so for S being one, you know that uh, communication is log D and the variance is about D. But as you keep in, uh, repeating it multiple times, uh, you can increase your communication and get a smooth trade-off between communication and variance. Yeah. And uh, this scheme, essentially what we see is just a, a generalization of the previous, uh, uh, or most of the previous quantization schemes. So uh, the QSGD is just a specific case of this entire quantization scheme that I've just described. So if you take the set of points to be the set of all some S sparse vectors, then uh, the point set to be the set of all S sparse binary vectors, then what you end up is just the, QS, with this, the QSGD scheme, okay? So our scheme generalizes most of the previous quantization schemes. And as a bonus, what we get is that this vector quantization scheme also preserves privacy, okay? Uh, so, which is very important uh, parameter here to understand because 
even in federated mod mo learning models, you don't really want to share your private data. So preserving privacy is of utmost importance. And we see that VQSGD scheme directly preserves privacy as well, like certain instances do. And by privacy, I refer to the notion of differential privacy. Uh, that is by looking at the output, uh, you basically want your inputs to be indistinguishable. So any close by inputs to be indistinguishable. And in fact, what we show here is a, a stronger notion. We show that any two gradients will be indistinguishable. So previously in terms of uh, private gradient quantization, the previous work, the best known work was that of CPSGT, where the authors added some binomial, a discrete noise to quantized gradients to achieve privacy. And here now the communication now varies as, uh, which is a parameter of the amount of noise that you want to add. And that depends on the privacy parameters that you want. However, the communication is still large. So you need at least D bits of communication here uh, to achieve, to get an unbiased estimate of the gradient and the variance is about D. And what we show in that uh, using certain point sets, uh, the vector quantization directly gives you uh, privacy. So you don't really need to add for the noise to the quantized gradients. And the idea is very simple. That is, if you take any two points within the unit ball, yes, and if you look at the mapping to a particular uh, vertex of the point set, then the privacy here is preserved because uh, most points will have, so close by points will have uh, very little variance in terms of uh, the coefficients of the convex combinations. Okay. So what we get is privacy. However, it is not for free. We pay for privacy in terms of uh, variance uh, bounds. Uh, however, the communication remains the same. So the, we do not incur additional communication cost to achieve privacy here. So uh, one very simple construction that we uh, consider here is that of a cross polytope scheme. So consider this uh, set of 2D points where each point is essentially a, a scaled standard unit vector. Okay, so you take all the unit vectors, so plus minus EI, scale it by root D. So we can see that this point set satisfies the characterization. That is the unit ball will be contained within the convex cell of this point set. Okay, so this directly gives you an unbiased estimate with a variance of uh, about D and the communication is log D. However, the scheme, as we can uh, uh, show very easily, also achieves privacy. However, the privacy parameter is not the best that we can do. We can uh, improve on these things. Uh, and in fact, what we show is that any VQSGT scheme can be made differentially private for any par privacy parameter epsilon. And what we get is epsilon zero privacy instead of epsilon delta privacy that was achieved by the previous works. And uh, the way we do it is using a randomized response scheme over our quantization scheme. So randomized response scheme was init uh, initially suggested by Warner uh, in 65. So the idea is like, whenever you get an output of the quantization, uh, you, you basically send the correct answer with certain probability or you send a different vertex with a different probability. And just by this uh, randomizing this response will get you uh, a privacy uh, of epsilon for any epsilon larger than zero. However, the price of privacy here is paid by uh, an increased variance term. So you, uh, so the variance term increased by a factor of uh, size of the cardinality of the point set. However, the communication still remains uh, small. And moreover, we also uh, show experimentally that uh, using our vector quantization scheme, in particular with the cross polytope with certain number of repetitions, uh, we are able to beat the performance uh, relative to the QSGT scheme. And we do that even with uh, way fewer uh, communication compared to QSGT. So in summary, uh, what we suggest is a vector quantization scheme. So the scheme is based on the convex hull of uh, point set and based on various point sets that you choose, you get uh, different trade-offs between variance and communication. Uh, the best that we can get is uh, using a random sampling. Uh, the explicit constructions that we suggest are a factor of log away from uh, 
reaching the optimal. However, for a constant variance term, we reach the optimal using epsilon x. Moreover, we also see that some of these quantization schemes also give us privacy directly. And also like any other non-private quantization scheme can be made private using a randomized response scheme. And uh, this entire thing generalizes all the previous uh, quantization schemes that were suggested in literature, uh, most of them. And finally, I want to end with a set of open questions. So essentially, we still don't know whether what we achieve, uh, that is variance times communication being equal to D, if that is optimal for any unbiased estimate. Uh, however, for a constant variance, uh, we know this is optimal, uh, but for something which is, uh, uh, for anything which is like sublinear communication, we don't know whether our schemes are optimal or not. Moreover, the explicit constructions that we have are a factor of log D away from the randomized ones. So one way to uh, achieve this is probably using uh, a union of polytopes or maybe some other uh, Minkowski sum of polytopes or something like that, that can probably improve on the bounds. And finally, like uh, we still want to investigate what are the optimal trade-offs between private quantization. So if you want to achieve any privacy, then what are the trade-offs uh, that you have to do in terms of, so what is the price for privacy that we pay in terms of communication and variance? And yeah, so that's it, thank you. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, GV. By the way, uh, there is an option down, down there to clap. So I just clapped so you can use it. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's also, there's a chat that I saw that there's some activity on the chat, which is very nice. So. Uh, if you have question and so on and so forth. I think we have time for a very, very quick question to GV, if anyone has a question before we move to the next talk. Uh, if there's no question, I can ask a question. Sure. Uh, one very quick question. So I'm very interested in the statement you said that Reed Miller codes here are optimal in terms of, you said communication cost. And in what sense? And I mean, I, I was very, a little bit, I'm, I'm very curious why Reed Miller codes? Uh, so they are basically, uh, we are getting to Hadamard matrices in some sense. So Reed Muller codes uh, are optimal because the number of code words, so we are looking at linear Reed Muller codes. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. Degree one Reed Muller codes. Uh, so, but yeah. So degree one Reed Muller codes, the number of code words are the least that you can get. So it's about 2D. Okay, so uh, for any d-dimensional code, you have only 2D code words here. And we see that for any other binary linear code, uh, we achieve the same variance bound. So in terms of variance, we cannot improve. So the only way we can improve is by reducing communication and you cannot do anything less than log D anyway. Okay. Thanks a lot, GV, again. Uh, I'm gonna clap again. Yeah. Because clapping is free. Uh, and and uh, next uh, we have Nicola or Nicholas, and he's yes. going to talk about revisiting, revisiting randomized gossip algorithm. Yes. Hi all. Can you hear me well? Yes. Nice. Thank you very much for the invitation and thank you for organizing this. So I will start sharing my screen. One second. Can you? See them well? Can you see the slides or not? Yeah, perfect. Yes. Okay, nice. So uh, today I will speak about revisiting randomized gossip algorithms and I will focus on presenting a general framework, uh, some conversions rates and uh, novel block and accelerated protocols by focusing mostly on the accelerated setting of it. So this is a joint work uh, with Peter Richterich from Kaus University. And it's a work that we did last uh, summer um, but I think it's a good fit for this session because combine both coding aspects and optimization uh, viewpoint. So an overview of the talk, uh, you can consider it that it's divided in five main parts. The first two is something like a background, understanding what the average consensus problem is, why it's important, and some important connections between the average consensus problem and decentralized optimization. Uh, then the scheduled project methods for solving linear systems is uh, an interesting connection between what our framework is and what we try to solve. And then I will move on in the main uh, 
a contribution of the work, which is the optimization approach, where we will show how scheduling project methods, which is classical randomized, optim uh, randomized iterative methods for solving linear systems, can be interpreted as gossip algorithm when applied to special systems and coding the underlying network. And I will present at the end some numerical experiments and some future directions of research. So the average consensus problem is very simple, is popular in signal processing and control theory community, especially for the last 10 years and even more from the and seminal work of Tsitsiklis in 70s. So you have a network, each node has one particular value, one scalar, and the goal is by communicate only with its neighbors, to all the nodes of the network to compute the average of the whole network. This appears in several applications in engineering, like wireless sensor networks, uh, can formulate the rumor spreading in social networks or in clock synchronization. In my perspective, why I find this interesting is because you can construct protocols for solving the average consensus problem that can later extend to solve more difficult problems in decentralized optimization, where you have uh, to minimize a function f of x, and each one of the nodes, instead of having one specific scalar, has uh, one particular function. And the goal is by doing some uh, computations and communications to evaluate the, minima the minimum point of the general function. And this is the problem that appears normally, is a distributed setting where the F normally is too large that cannot uh, fit in a single computer. And a single computer is not powerful enough for this task. Uh, so each node has one specific distribution, uh, make updates using stochastic gradients, and then uh, communicate with its neighbors to evaluate the minimization of the function value. So just a bit of a background of why this is important and where it appears uh, in the literature. So if you start from the one, uh, the decentralized parallel stochastic gradient descent, and you notice how the updates are made, uh, there is the paper of Xiao, Ling Xiao and Boyd of 2005, where they propose exactly the same method for solving average consensus. Then this uh, protocol extended for solving strongly convex functions by Neji and Ostaglar. And just recently, uh, three years ago, uh, in a Lian et al. paper, extended for solving deep neural networks. Similar, it happens with a um, asynchronous version of it. And this is where we will focus mostly today on the pairwise gossip of Boyd, where extended to the strongly convex case and recently used the same algorithm in the deep neural network for solving uh, in ICML 2018. And again, the same thing, you can see that exactly what it happens. People from a decade ago use it for solving average consensus. Then they extended it about five or six years ago to strongly convex and convex decentralized optimization problems. And recently, all of these protocols are used for solving uh, deep neural networks. And so the algorithm that I will focus mostly the talk today is uh, the randomized uh, pairwise gossip algorithm of Boyd, where they suggested that uh, you have the network, each network has specific values, and how the updates are made is that one random node is activated, select one, only one of its neighbors, update a, a communicate, and update their values to their average. And by doing that continuously, and after specific number of iterations, you converge in the accuracy of, uh, of the average point that you want to, do, to converge to. Okay, so before explaining the main methods that we, we show and why our methods solve this problem, let me make a small uh, parenthesis on scheduling projects methods for solving linear systems. So if we have a very large linear system, can you see when, yes, can you hear me? Someone speaks? Yeah, I can, but I don't know if anyone has a question. Someone speak, I think, no? 
Okay, let's continue. Yeah. So if you have any question, feel free to interrupt me and ask at any point. Uh, so uh, we have a linear system, it's li a large linear system, and we assume that it's consistent, but we don't make assumption like the matrix A is full rank. We don't assume that the linear system has a unique solution. And uh, in particular, we are interested in one specific solution, the X, which is closer to a given vector C, which satisfy the linear system. This is, in some literature, is known as best approximation problem, which essentially you find the solution of the linear system, which is closer to your given point. And the algorithms that I will present today, and I will show, if the given point is the starting point of the method, all of them converge to the uh, solution of the linear system, which is closer to the starting point of the method. And uh, just in general framework, uh, a method that doing that is the schedule project method for solving the best approximation. So you start from one x zero, and in each step, you select a sketch version of the original linear system, and you project into it uh, to obtain the next iterate. And this algorithm has a closed form expression like the one appear there, where matrices SK can be any sketch matrix drawn from a given distribution. And it was shown that this general framework can be simply analyzed. And the theorem is the one that appear here. And you can see in equation four, converge linearly and depends on the minimum non-zero eigenvalue of a matrix W, where this W is a symmetric positive semi-definite matrix that depends on the A and on the matrix S. So a special case of this is the randomized Katzmars method that we are all being aware of. So just simply from the illustration, how this works, if omega is one, so the step size is one here, you make simple projections here for illustration purposes and just put it alternating in the two hyperplanes. And you start from one x zero and after a specific number of iterations, you know how far you are from the X star. And because it's consistent linear system, you always know that you have this X star. And the matrix here is different because you have a special case. Okay, now that I, I explain what is the average consensus and I made a small background literature on the scheduling project methods and why they solve linear systems. Up to this point, any of the audience has any, any question? Okay, good. So I will move to an optimization formulation of the average consensus, which is, uh, is known in the literature. So people know that this exists. So if you take the average consensus problem, you can represent it as optimization problem uh, with uh, find again the X point, which is closer to a given parameter C which normally this is the starting point of the values of the nodes of the network and subject to this constraint. If xi and xj are equal, if the age between them exists, so if they are connected in the network. And the optimal solution of this uh, problem is exactly the solution that we want to find in the average consensus. The average of all values of all nodes. And the question here is, are we able to express this problem differently? And if we do it, what we can gain from it? And uh, simple, that's the optimization problem. And if you take the constraints and you represent them as a linear system, then this is exactly the problem that all the scheduling project methods solve. And particularly the randomized Katzmars method. So you take a linear system, I will explain what this linear system in is, but you can represent the constraints. You can run the randomized customers or any other scheduling project method, and you can solve the average consensus problem. And there are some specific properties of the average consensus linear system. The right hand side needs to be zero. Uh, you can show that the rank of this matrix A is N minus one. So this particular, this is very important because normally the analysis in the randomized Katzmars setting 
in many papers, assume that the matrix A is full rank. So if you don't have this assumption, which you can extend your theory to it, uh, to have it, then you cannot have a method for solving the average consensus. It's important. And now we, we in the paper, we went and we construct specific uh, matrices that can represent this average consensus system. In this talk, I will focus only on the incident matrix. But you can have a Laplacian, you can have the random walk uh, normalized Laplacian and the normalized incident matrices. And each one of them, if you use them, you can obtain a different Gaussian protocol using the sketch and project methods for solving this particular problem. And for these that are not aware of the incident matrix of the graph, is a, a matrix that it has the number of rows are the number of ages and the number of columns are the number of nodes and it has one and minus one in each row if the two nodes are connected and we have undirected graph so that's uh, that's clear what it what it means okay so now if we take the randomized Katzmars method for solving this particular problem with the incident matrix then we take the update of the randomized Katzmars, we put the right-hand side to be zero, the matrix to be the incident matrix, then the update is the one up here here. And if we take on top of it that the step size is one, then we can see that the update of the randomized Katzmars is this particular one here. So what it does in each step, select one specific age, takes the two nodes, exchange their information and update their values to their average. And this is exactly the randomized gossip algorithm of Boyd et al. that I explained in the beginning of this talk. And what is very interesting is that if you take the randomized Katzmars method and you specified it to this setting, then the conversions rate of the method is exactly the same with the one appear in the original paper of uh, Boyd. And I have, I have a question about this. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. So who's doing this because you have a graph. So who's doing the update on it? Every node, they're all doing it at the same time? No, no. So the, how this, there are different set, different decentralized updates that you can do. Normally, if you have a synchronous updates, all the nodes simultaneously communicate with all of their neighbors and update their values. But this specific setting of randomized gossip, how it works is that you have a network and randomly, each one of the nodes activated. You don't select which one, but you have something like a Poisson clock that it ticks. Okay. So one of the nodes is activated, select a subset of their neighbors and update their values to their average. That, that's the idea. Okay. And um, this is exactly, uh, okay, where we stop. Ah, okay, in the randomized customers for solving the average consensus problem. And now what is interesting, and this is where uh, I will focus the rest of the talk, is that by doing this connection, we can borrow stuff from the, and borrow uh, uh, tools from the linear system solvers in order to propose uh, new algorithms for solving the average consensus problems. In our work, we did several of these connections. I will explain later just briefly. But in this talk, I will focus on the accelerated variance. So uh, there are two momentum variants of the Katzmars method that uh, they work and uh, in practice faster than the randomized Katzmars. And as like any other optimization algorithm, the two variants is the one is the heavy ball momentum and the other one is the nester of acceleration. Uh, in the, regarding the rates, I will focus on the Nestero of later, but just to see how the updates of the heavy ball momentum works, you have the randomized Katzmars, which is this part here, and you add the heavy ball momentum uh, on top of the update. So in each step, each node updates its value using also its previous uh, its value. And uh, this algorithm for analyzing the general setting in one of our previous work, but here we focus it on the average consensus. So how the method works at the moment. So we have that uh, is slightly different, is still doing pairwise gossip, but at the moment, all the nodes of the network are updated their values simultaneously. 
but they don't communicate. So if you see the graph here, the node six and seven update their values using their current iterates and their previous iterate. They still exchange only the one value, but update their values using also their previous information. And the rest of the nodes either update their values uh, at the same time with the pair, pair here, or they save the updates and they know in which inter iteration they update their value. In the paper, we explain how this can be in done efficiently in distributed manner. And uh, it works very well in practice. And uh, compare, there is a comparison between what existed in the literature as an accelerated gossip. And the only difference between the heavy ball momentum that we suggest and the shift register case that exists in the literature is in the fact that our, uh, the rest of the nodes of the network update their values uh, without communicate. And we have some uh, experiments that showing that actually by having the beta and as you increase beta, we notice as you go close to 0 0.5, you always have better performance. But if you exceed uh, point 0 0.5, which normally the momentum parameter is selected 0 0.9, we notice that uh, sometimes diverge. And this is predicted from the theory as well. Uh, okay, and here let's go to the accelerated variant with a uh, nester of acceleration. Uh, I will not go into the details of how the acceleration it happens in the general case of the randomized catchments, but I will focus on our con contribution with the accelerated gossip. So here, what we do is, is very simple, is that we still have a pair of nodes that communicate and update their values using uh, to their average. So in each step, so the difference is, uh, uh, let me rephrase it. You start with two sequences, V0 and X0 from the same point. You give this beta, gamma, and alpha, these specific parameters that you have in the network. And then you select the pair of the nodes that you want to update and update their values using these three updates rules here. So you exchange the information of the yi and update the value of the vi using only your vi, the yi of your value, and the yj of the node that you communicate with. And the rest of the nodes of the network update their values using only their previous information without uh, communicate with any of their neighbors, just by themselves. So it doesn't count as a communication cost. It's still the same um, cost that cost the, the randomized pairwise gossip of void that doing only one pair, uh, select one pair and update their values to their average, cost exactly the same with this update in terms of communications. And the difference is the here, which is clear uh, faster. So if you, this is the simple randomized gossip algorithm of Boyd, and this is a conversions, and this is a conversions of the randomized Katzmars method. Now of the accelerated gossip, which we borrow tools from the analysis of accelerated Katzmars method, is that we take this Lyapunov function, and we can see that instead of having a linear rate like the randomized Katzmars method, we have this square root there. So in order of magnitude is always faster. And uh, we can see this new parameter, you can consider it that in most of the accelerated gossip setting is close to one, but belongs in this interval. And this is how we obtain acceleration. And just to see some experiments, so the blue lines in this experiment is exactly the randomized customers or the pairwise gossip of Boyd. The orange line is the one, is a previously known algorithms that consider accelerated. And uh, our approach, our two accelerated schemes are the green and the red line. And you can see, for example, if I just take 
here I, I we make experiments on typical wireless sensor networks. This is a 2D grid graph. This is a random geometry graph, and this is a cycle graph. And in all of them, we notice that uh, our methods are faster. And if you take just one simple example, after 200 iterations uh, in, in the 2D grid graph, our method achieved 10 to the minus eight uh, um, accuracy, while the previous known methods achieved 10 to the minus four. And how, how big is the graph? So here, here I have 20 by 20, 30 by 30, it's small graphs, but we actually use them in real life applications and all of them work really good also in, in large scale graphs. And do, do you have any uh, preference on whether to use Nesterov or the acceleration? So in, uh, in practice, we notice that uh, the Nesterov acceleration would provide parameters that in most of the times we notice that it works very good. The heavy ball momentum, uh, this beta is only a single parameter that how we define it is that uh, we, we select what the theory predicts, but sometimes it wasn't as favorable as the star of acceleration. Okay. And to conclude, uh, this is a paper where it shows all of that. So in this talk, uh, I focus only on the general framework that I wanted to show that scheduling project methods for solving linear systems are very useful for uh, construct randomized gossip algorithms for solving the average consensus problems. And uh, we show the first accelerated randomized gossip algorithm provably, which to the best of our knowledge, it was, this algorithm didn't exist in the setting of, uh, in the stochastic setting. Uh, what exists in the paper but didn't cover it in this work is that all of these methods can solve a weighted average consensus problem, which is a gener generalization of the one that I, I explained. All the methods can uh, interpret, you can obtain more algorithms, more gossip algorithms. Here I focus only on the incident matrix. If instead of the incident you choose a, La a Laplacian matrix, then this can give you a better acceleration, a, a faster method. Uh, I didn't cover block variance where you can have simultaneously pairwise updates of several parts of the graph. I didn't cover dual randomized gossip algorithms. And I didn't explain how um, um, more, more algorithms from the scheduling project literature for solving linear systems can be seen as uh, gossip algorithms. For example, there is a popular gossip algorithm called eavesdrop that can be seen a special case of the katzmars mortkin uh, method for solving linear systems. And as, uh, and I conclude as a takeaway message, I would like to see this work as uh, from two viewpoints. If you belong in control theory, signal processing community, then this is a new framework for the design and analysis of gossip algorithms for solving the average consensus problem. If you belong in numerical linear algebra and optimization and you play around with randomized Katzmars method, uh, gauss Seidel, and all of these variants, then all of them can have a decentralized nature and can be used. Uh, uh, the average consensus problem can be seen as an interesting application of, this, of these methods. And something that we are currently working on is novel Gaussian protocol based on Katzmars type methods and extend the gossip averaging algorithms to a more general setting. And just last week, we posted online a recent paper where we extend some of these results with colleagues from EPFL. And it's very related to decentralized optimization, federated learning, and all of these ideas uh, can be extended, not easily, but can be extended to more general and interesting setting. Uh, thank you. Okay, thanks a lot, uh, Nicola. Am I, yeah, I'm unmuted. So I'm gonna clap. Okay. And I don't know if we have a, a, a time for a very quick question, so. I have a question. Yes, <laughs> yes. So in the sketch and project algorithm, you mm -hmm. can plug in any sketching matrix, like sampling, random matrices, coding-based matrices. Can you use these sketching matrices in the graph setting? Yes, yes. So in the graph setting, you can be more clever of how to use this SK. 
For example, if the SK is like the random, is the coordinate vector, you obtain the randomized customers where I focus this work. If you take the SK to be a, a column sub matrix of the identity, then you obtain a method like the randomized block customers. And you can uh, have interesting gossip algorithms that you have uh, more than one pair that communicate in each time. Now, if you use Hadamard uh, matrices or other sketch uh, matrices are captured from the theory. So how they work in practice uh, in graphs, you need to make sure that the communications are decentralized. So in each, in each update, this SK should be selected in order for the method to communicate only with its neighbors. If you do that, then the theory holds and everything goes smooth. I see, okay, thank you. Thanks again, uh, Nicholas. And then uh, our first talk is by Mert and he's gonna talk about computational polarization and straggling, straggler resilient serverless optimization. Thanks Mert. Hi everyone, uh, let me share my screen. Okay, so thank you so much for organizing this uh, and thank you all for joining in these uh, difficult times. I'll be talking about um, error correcting codes for distributed optimization and computations. Uh, so as you're all aware, we have this big data problem Every day we create so many uh, billion gigabytes of data and the data grows faster than the world economy. And we have seen the impact of uh, having very large uh, data sets. We witnessed the deep learning revolution. Essentially, these are black box, very complex models. Um, we don't exactly know how they work and then when they work better than simple uh, prediction models. Um, in, in machine learning and data science, it's very clear, more data results in better, more accurate models and uh, better predictions. And they give rise to large scale distributed computing problems, uh, such as the ones in deep uh, neural networks. Uh, but these complex models, uh, although they can increase accuracy, they are black boxes. It's very really hard to interpret what the model uh, is actually doing. So it is actually a, a better practice to um, explore simple to complex models. And we would like to do this inexpensively. Uh, so to address this question, our approach is uh, using serverless systems, which I'll, I'll define in a second, uh, with error correction to auto-scale computations. Um, so we will consider a distributed computation setting where we uh, transmit local data sets to different workers, and we have lots of workers. Um, so recently, uh, there was very interesting uh, line of work uh, in applying error correcting codes to distributed uh, matrix multiplication and related problems. This one is from uh, Lee et al. 2017. So here the task is to uh, multiply a matrix with a vector or some other uh, matrix B. And then typically uh, you can split the matrix A into sub matrices A1, A2, A3, A4, and then distribute these to workers. And normally they will multiply these uh, smaller uh, sub matrices with B and then send the result to a master. Um, so the error correcting uh, code way of doing this is uh, very interesting. So you will use one worker and you will compute a linear combination of these data matrices and then uh, this will be multiplied with B. Now we have this extra redundancy. It's a redundant computation. So if one worker's result is not available, if it's late or if there's some sort of an error, we can use the others to reconstruct the computation, right? So this will tolerate up to one error. And in this context, these are called stragglers. If there's one late computation, we can just ignore that. So any three out of these four workers will uh, suffice in uh, computing A times B. Um, so I'll, I'll talk about serverless systems. This is a new paradigm in distributed computing. These are extremely low cost systems, there's no upfront investment, you just pay per millisecond, uh, but you just have very uh, short duration for your computations and very really, uh, small, uh, moderate uh, computational resources. Uh, in particular, there is this PyRen package, you can run Python functions on uh, serverless systems on Amazon Lambda, other cloud services like Google, Microsoft Azure, they also provide this systems. Uh, these are stateless, meaning that 
there is no file system access. Uh, any state should be stored in some storage service. And ideally, they should be very, very uh, small independent computational tasks. But the nice thing is that these are very scalable, very cheap. We can call 10,000, 20,000 workers. Um, but there is a big problem. If you look at the return times, uh, you will see a very significant uh, tail latency. So if you look at compute latency and the number of workers, this is a histogram, you will see that a significant portion of the computations, uh, they arrive very late. Uh, some small portion, some small ratio here arrives uh, less than in less than 20 seconds, but to get all your computations, you have to wait more than a minute. And this is called the straggler problem. Um, so uh, we will use polar codes uh, to, to address this. Uh, our work is inspired by polar codes. Um, polar codes were invented uh, by Adol Arkan in 2009. These are the first constructions of codes with explicit construction. They probably achieve the channel capacity for any uh, symmetric discrete member of this channel. Uh, in fact, they will be used in uh, 5G uh, radio standard in the control channel along with the LDPC codes. So, um, and the theory behind polar codes is very interesting. So it's now standard in information theory and coding theory courses. They combine communication channels recursively and they obtain better and worse channels recursively. And then in this way, they, they achieve capacity. So here is a very quick um, slide on the, the, the inner workings of the polar code. So you get a communication channel, W, this is a binary uh, input channel, like an erasure channel or a uh, binary symmetric channel. So you apply this transformation uh, on Boolean uh, inputs. And then you combine these two communication channels and you get two different transform channels. And then you extend this recursively to four by four, 16 by 16 constructions. What happens is that the transform channels get better and worse. And when you do this recursively, you get a set of very good channels and a very bad channels. And then in the end, you only use the good channels. And in information theory, this is uh, calculated with respect to mutual information. Um, when you use the channels with uh, good mutual information, you actually achieve capacity. So we, we will um, use the combination ID in polar codes to come up with computational versions of polar codes. Uh, and we call this computational polarization. So we have some data A, this is a data matrix. Uh, and we have a worker, like an Amazon Lambda serverless system worker. This is very local. It can only tolerate small computation. Uh, and then it outputs the computation, which is f of a, some function applied on a. You can imagine this uh, being some machine learning model, some linear algebra operation. In optimization, this can be some gradient or Hessian computation locally. So when you have two workers, you can uh, give them two different data sets, right? Uh, partitions of an original data set. And then normally they, they would compute f of a1 and f of a2, right? So the idea behind uh, computational polar codes is using a transformation like this. This is a two by two Hadamard transform applied to matrices. Here we add and subtract. This is the familiar uh, butterfly block in fast Fourier transform, Hadamard transform and wavelet transforms. And then uh, we transmit these transformed blocks to the workers. And then they compute the function on these local transform data, f of uh, a1 plus a2, f of a1 minus a2. Okay, and then we have a very special decoding mechanism. This is also inspired by polar codes, although it works over reals. So uh, we will first decode f of a1, the function evaluated on the first local data set. To do this, you actually need to wait for both of these workers. And then we assume that the workers have some random variable uh, computation times. Here it's t1 and t2. So to get f of a1, you had to wait for uh, both of them. So you can compute it in max of t1 comma t2 time, right? And you can get f of a1. Here we are assuming that the function is linear. And when I have f of a1 plus a2, f of a1 minus a2, I can decode f of a1 by just solving a linear system. Next, assume that you have f of a1 available somehow, okay? And now I can use either worker one or worker two to get f of a2, 
right? And then this can happen in minimum of T1 and T2 uh, at time min T1, T2. So what you see here is uh, an interesting transformation. So the, the uh, worker runtimes T1 and T2, they get transformed to the maximum and minimum, right? And then the idea is to apply this procedure recursively. Uh, if you look at the runtimes here, this is the probability density of a worker return distribution. Let's say it's uniform. Uh, it gets transformed to the maximum and the minimum. And if you have two independent uniforms, if you calculate the maximum, it does have a triangular distribution skewed towards the right. And the minimum is skewed, and also triangular, it's skewed towards the left, right? And then precisely, it's this uh, T1, T2 to maximum and minimum uh, mapping. It's a two by two to two by two uh, mapping. You, we can extend this to four by four, uh, very similar to the fast Fourier transform way of combining these blocks. We have these two identical blocks, and then we use two more, these uh, two by two Hadamard matrices to combine it into a four by four block. And then we uh, input these to the workers, right? Now what happens is that uh, we get the max and min in the first block, and then you compute another max and another min on these variables. So you get maxes of maxes and ma minimums of maxes, maxes of minimums and minimums of minimums. Now this is a four by four uh, transformation. So we call this a computational polarization process. It is actually a functional martingale in, in a Hilbert space. It is like a random walk. You start with a function, and then there's a functional mapping. Uh, it follows this rule with a certain probability it gets squared. Uh, it's actually probability one half, and with probability one half, uh, it gets mapped to this value. And then this is a martingale. If you average these two functions, it is identical to the original function. Uh, and then we have a theorem on convergence. If you iterate this, these functions in L2 norm, uh, they will converge. And the rate of convergence is some exponential. It's very really similar to the convergence rate uh, to capacity in polar codes. And in particular, these uh, functions, these are the cumulative density functions of the runtimes. They converge to unit step functions, which means that the runtime distributions, uh, they converge to Dirac measure they converge to uh, direct delta functions. And here's an illustration. So if this is the original runtime, my workers are uniform, the computation times are uniform between zero and one. At the first step, they will be triangular. And then the average will be equal to the original uh, probability density function. And then from these two, we will create two more by extending the construction to four by four. And then this is the martingale, the sum of these two is equal to this. And then the sum of these two is equal to this. And if you iterate this infinitely many times, these functions, they get spiky and spiky, and then they converge to Dirac delta. Um, and then how do we use this as an error correction scheme? Uh, it's actually very simple. We just find the undesirable ones, undesirable runtimes, and then we fix the inputs to zero. Essentially, you just transmit zero matrix, but in practice, you actually don't do anything because it's all zero, so you don't compute that branch. It means that you actually cancel this bad looking runtime, right? Which is uh, skewed to the, towards the right. And then you're left with the, the better looking ones. So your system will run in these uh, much nicer distributed runtimes. And here's a cartoonish description of this process. We have mediocre workers. These are not very fast, not very slow, right? When we uh, apply this two by two transformation, in computation polarization, we get a fast worker and a slow worker. And if you combine two of these fast workers, you get something even faster, like a GPU, and then some of the slower ones. And then you can freeze the slower ones to zero and not use them. Effectively, it makes the system uh, run uh, faster. Mert, I have a quick question. Maybe it's a conceptual question that I'm uh, struggling sure. with. So here you have like things going in series and things going in parallel. So how, how do you avoid not things having to wait for, for the other people to give them the input to process or this okay. Yeah, so that's a very good question. So when you freeze a worker like here, right? So the decoder runs successively, right? First, it tries to decode the function evaluated at A1. 
and then A2, and then at A3, and then at A4, right? So if you can evaluate F of A1, you can, right? If yep. you can't, we will freeze it to zero. So whatever you need at a certain point, it is either computed or frozen to zero. Oh, okay. Yeah. But you're right that there's that uncertainty. It works fine because of this special... Uh, because, because I'm assuming you're going to go deeper into this, right? Yeah. And this wouldn't be a problem for the third stage and fourth stage? Uh, no, if you follow this order, it won't be a problem. Okay. And then the same order arises in polar codes. There is a very okay. specific uh, sequence uh, that you should do decoding. Um, if you do that, there, there won't be any problem. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, and then here's how the system looks like. So we have some encoding step, uh, which is that butterfly transformation on the data matrix. And then we put everything to a uh, storage service like Amazon S3. And then we call these Lambda functions. Uh, and then we do decoding locally. Uh, this is how the distributed computing system will look like. Uh, and we can compare this with other coding methods. And recently, lots of different methods for distributed matrix multiplication and other linear algebra operations have been proposed. So there are read Muller codes, uh, LT, uh, Luby transform codes, LDPC codes, uh, faster read Solomon codes based on uh, fast transforms. So computational polar codes here have an advantage because they have super cheap encoding and decoding complexity. Encoding and decoding, it doesn't involve any uh, matrix or, or number multiplication. It only uses addition or subtraction. Uh, and because of this, it can scale to thousands, 10,000, 20,000 workers. Uh, and here's a comparison between uh, read, uh, read Solomon codes and polar codes in encoding complexity. Green curve is the polar code encoding. Uh, and then if you decode, if you encode read Solomon codes naively, you will get the blue curve, which is cubic in dimension. You can make that faster with uh, the Fermat uh, numbered transform, but it's still uh, slow compared to the polar code. And then in decoding time, there's even a larger gap uh, because the decoding operation in read uh, Solomon codes is, is very slow and it, it, it doesn't get uh, better with the fast uh, number transforms. Uh, and here is uh, a histogram of compute times on Amazon Lambda. This is uh, real data. And then when we apply our computation polarization scheme, we get this much better runtime because we freeze lots of uh, computation paths to zero. And then by fixing them to zero, we adjust the rate. Here we are using uh, 1,000 redundant, redundant workers and a total of uh, 1,500 workers. Okay, so the rate is one third. And this is why we, we get this very favorable runtime distribution. And then we can use this in optimization uh, for least squares models, generalized linear models, such as um, logistic regression support vector machine computation usually boils down to matrix vector products that look like uh, AX and A transpose Y. And then we apply uh, the, the coding and decoding mechanism. And then here is time versus objective value uh, in random data. And as we increase, uh, if, as we decrease the rate, the convergence actually improves because we get rid of uh, the stragglers. And on the right, uh, you see the, the ImageNet data. This is a very simple uh, logistic regression problem on ImageNet. Uh, and then this data set is very large. We have to use distributed workers. And when we use 128 workers, we get these uh, blue points in convergence. And when we decrease the rate to one half, uh, we get the orange uh, curve. It's, it's definitely faster as we in increase, as we decrease the rate. So th this can be done for linear functions of data or polynomials, it will boil down to same computations. Uh, it can also be applied to gradient and Hessian uh, calculations involving the data matrix. I have a very uh, short example on this. Um, so in, in um, zeroth order methods, we actually don't have access to gradients, we only have access to function values and we can estimate gradients if you have a function f of x the gradient with respect to xi can be approximated uh, via a finite difference approximation. Here, E sub i is the ordinary basis uh, vector. Um, and we can come up with a coded version of this. Instead of the ordinary basis vectors, we perturb 
the function in arbitrary directions. And then this essentially measures the inner product of the true gradient vector with these direction zi's, right? Uh, and then if you choose these zi directions um, using the coding matrix we uh, the, uh, introduced, the decoding problem is essentially a linear computation problem. You can decode the gradient from uh, these uh, function differences. Um, and then here's an application of this to adversarial examples. Given a trained neural network, uh, finding adversarial examples is a constraint optimization problem. We have an image uh, x0, and we would like to find the closest image in some norm, uh, which is classified in a wrong class. Here, the probability of being classified to J is greater than the true probability of being in class I. This is a constraint. And then this way, we can find a nearby example which is classified uh, wrong. And we compare um, the training cost versus time uh, in CIFAR 10. Here, this is an airplane. It's classified as a truck. Uh, and then in finding this example, you're solving this optimization problem using the uh, coded gradient estimator. And then when we do the um, computational polarization uh, we get the red curve in convergence. This is done on uh, Amazon uh, Lambda as well. And we are comparing it with finite differences, FT, which is the usual way of approximating gradients, perturbing the function in ordinary basis directions. And then it's also comparing it with structured evolution. This is a uh, novel idea. It uses Hadamard matrices, uh, and then it is a random search method. Because we uh, utilize redundancy, we get rid of the stragglers, and then we get a much better uh, convergence time trade-off. Um, so some conclusions and uh, future work ideas. So th this is a scalable L L and error-resilient method. The encoding and decoding is very cheap. Um, this is the most important aspect. It can be done for least squares and generalized linear models. So one thing we're uh, trying to come up with is um, privacy enforcing and encrypted ways of distributing data. It looks like this can be done uh, with a clever choice of um, uh, coding matrix. Uh, and we are also trying to uh, extend this to more general convex optimization problems. Uh, for instance, problems with constraints, non-convex optimization problems. And uh, we are, actually trying to extend it to neural network problems uh, and we develop convex optimization version uh, convex optimization approaches for these neural networks and this is something we are currently working on and here's a related paper on this uh, exact convex optimization formulations for uh, neural networks so that's all thank you very much for, for your attention if you have any questions i'd be very happy to answer Thanks a lot, Mert. So I think we have time for one question. Uh, can I ask a question? This is Gauri. Of course, yeah. Uh, hi, Mert. Really nice talk. Um, a quick question. You said that uh, these codes are comparable with rateless uh, LT codes. Uh, could you comment on how the runtime compares? Uh, I see that the encoding and decoding complexity is the same uh, as LT codes. So yes, you're right. In LT code, you also get linear time uh, encoding and decoding. Yeah. In our comparisons, however, uh, the error in LT codes, uh, they were much higher um, mm -hmm. because of the randomness in their construction. Uh, you, you're right that they're also fast in encoding and decoding, mm -hmm. but the, the performance is, I believe it's, it's worse. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I also have like a very quick question. So when you compare this image net data, you show a plot where you are comparing with uh, uncoded with 128 workers versus coded with 256 workers. Yes, right, this one. Um, so wouldn't it be a fair comparison to also do uncoded with 256 workers because you, are, you have that much of redundancy and then see what would be the time Oh, yeah, I see. Yeah, you, you're right. You're absolutely right. If we had uh, 256 workers and no coding, uh, we could have partitioned the data more finely, right? Right. Yeah, you're absolutely right. But we didn't do that but primarily because uh, in ImageNet, uh, it's distributed over classes. 
uh, where every worker reads just one file and every class file is stored in that. So it, it's because of the data granularity, but you're absolutely right. If we are free to divide the data any way we like, that would be a much better fair comparison. You, you're right. Right. So uh, one thing is that I'm trying to do is uh, to take this thing in practice. And uh, like, uh, I work a lot with this AWS tools. Um, and uh, it, it seems like the, so there is some ad hoc stuff that are already being done to tackle this straggler thing. And like, if we want to use sophisticated coding things, it's like, yeah, it's, it's, it's like a hard sell. And one of these things is this, like if we, uh, but I understand your answer. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah, I, I see. So I think the simplest way to deal with stragglers is just replicating, right? Or one thing, yes, like that. Um, so it has to be or really maybe just neglect that thing, right? So uh, if it is a straggler, you just don't like, for example, we sometimes just don't deal with that at all. Um, we don't wait for it and uh, whatever we get, we just do it, uh, proceed with the iteration with that data. Does that make sense? Right, exactly. That's, that's another approach of like in stochastic gradient descent, you don't need to calculate the gradient. Only a subset would be basically work. Exactly. Right. But I, I don't think it's, it's clear which one is best if you wait for all do coding and then do exact gradient descent. So in, in our uh, simulations, when you're solving convex optimization problems, uh, in Newton's method, for instance, calculating the exact gradient is very important. Because if you don't, the algorithm might diverge. Mm -hmm. In training logistic regression, the algorithm can tolerate noise because it's a simple linear model. I think in, in those, you can ignore the stragglers. Uh, can I make a quick comment? Uh, so uh, for SGD, actually, if you in, uh, ignore the slow gradients, then we can prove that uh, that is better than doing coding. Because the um, you yeah. just Gauri, is this the slow and still gradient paper? Uh, no, that is with asynchrony. Here, uh, if you're ignoring slow gradients, uh, then it is just as if you have a, sl a smaller effective mini batch size if right. you're doing synchronous gradient aggregation. Uh, and for that case, with some simple back of the envelope calculations, you can show that it is. Uh, actually better to ignore slow gradients. But uh, that said, um, if you, uh, if say the data is heterogeneously distributed across the workers, then it may not be okay to ignore gradients from some worker that is consistently slow. Gauri, you also need the, uh, to guarantee that the, uh, somehow the stragglers are independent over time, right? You, you need that assumption also, right? Meaning, uh, yes, yes. Yeah, that's what I... I um, so on average, you see all the data points along the optimization somehow. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Okay, thanks a lot, Mert. And, and we, our last talk is uh, Rashmi, so I guess she's getting ready. Yes. Uh, hi, everyone. Hi, Salim. Hi, Rashmi. So Rashmi is going to talk about a locality-based approach for resilient computation. Cool. Thank you. So I'll just uh, share my slides right now. Can you all see my slides? Okay, okay awesome. Uh, Hi, everyone. First of all, uh, thanks a lot to all the organizers for the invitation. I'm delighted to be part of this session. So today I'm going to uh, talk about a new way of looking at coded computation via the lens of uh, locality of codes. This is a joint work. Just a moment. So the Zoom slide clicker isn't going that well. So let me see. Uh, okay, so this is a joint work with my PhD student, uh, Michael Rudo and my colleague, uh, Bankat Guruswami. So large scale distributed computation uh, today is ubiquitous with several frameworks supporting it and also a variety of workloads making use of such frameworks. It's also well known that uh, stragglers and failures are the norm in these uh, distributed computation setups and they affect tail latency, which is a critical metric in these systems. 
The redundancy uh, that is adding redundancy to computation is one approach for adding resilience. Uh, and as we have been seeing in the previous talks in the session, uh, however, adding such redundancy comes with a cost, both in terms of resources and energy, and hence one needs to add redundancy in a resource efficient manner. And it is in this context that uh, coded computation comes into the picture, uh, which is basically uh, the domain that is looking at using coding theory tools to add redundancy to computation in a resource efficient way. There have been several works on coded computation and looking at uh, several different frameworks. Uh, in my talk today, I'll be basically referring to computing and on encoded data as uh, coded computation. This form of coded computation have been used in computing systems uh, since several decades, uh, initially to protect against errors in memory and during computation that happens within a single machine. More recently, Lee et al. introduced this concept of coded computation in the distributed computation setup to provide resilience against unavailability such as stragglers and failures, uh, where they focused on matrix vector multiplication in a distributed setup. Since then, there has been a large body of work looking at coded computation in this distributed frameworks. In my talk today, the setting that I'll be looking at is computing functions uh, for multiple inputs. So let's say uh, we want to compute F on key inputs X1 to XK. There are multiple workers uh, in a distributed setting, uh, let's say W number of workers, and each worker evaluates this function F on the input point provided to it. And there is a central coordinator communicating with all the workers. So the setting pictorially would look like this, where the encode, there is an encoder which takes the input points x1 to xk on which we want to compute this function f. And xi tildes are the outputs of this encoder which are provided as inputs to worker i. So each worker gets an input. And then these, each of the workers compute f on the input points provided to them. And the decoder takes these outputs and decodes the desired output, which is f of x1 to f of x key. Now, out of these w workers, any s of them can straggle. Right? So the decoder uh, has to make do with only uh, w minus s of the outputs from, from these workers and decode the desired output. So in this setup, uh, one of the key metrics is the minimum number of workers that are needed to perform the computation in this resilient fashion, since that corresponds to the main resource overhead. Okay, so now let's look at when this function f is a linear function. So when f is linear, any linear erasure code that tolerates s arbitrary erasures is sufficient to guarantee the performance or meet the requirement that we just specified. This is because by linearity, function f and the encoding and decoding operations commute. And hence, we can just use any linear code and everything holds true. So the number of required workers when f is linear in order to tolerate s stragglers is just k plus s. And this can be achieved via any maximum distance separable code. However, handling nonlinear functions is highly challenging because the commutativity property that we just made use of for the linear functions just breaks. Okay. So for handling nonlinear functions, there are two broad categories of approaches. One of them is what I'll call algebraic approaches. And currently existing algebraic approaches uh, the most general class of functions that they are applicable for is multivariate polynomials. And this is what uh, my talk is going to be about today. So I'll come back to this approach uh, while briefly mentioning the other class of approaches. So the other class of approaches is uh, what I call learning-based approaches, where one uses machine learning and specifically neural networks to learn coded computation schemes. And these approaches are applicable for general nonlinear functions. For example, it could be a neural network end to end, 
which will be the function f if we are looking at machine learning inference systems. And surprisingly, even for such nonlinear functions, uh, learning based approaches can tolerate as stragglers with just k plus s number of workers, as it was the case for linear functions. Uh, however, uh, one thing to keep in mind is that the decoded outputs in these learning based approaches are only approximate. So I'll not be uh, going into details uh, of learning based approaches, but the details are present uh, in the references shown. So coming back to algebraic approaches, which is going to be the focus of today's talk. Algebraic approaches uh, currently are applicable for uh, general classes up to multivariate polynomials, and they're all based on uh, interpolation property of polynomials. Okay, so now uh, for a polynomial of degree D, the re minimum required number of workers in order to do the computation in a straggler resistant fashion is uh, as shown here, uh, this was due to D U et al, which is a min of two entities. So I'll give you all a moment to stare at this. So recall that K is the number of input points, D is the degree of the polynomial, S is the maximum number of stragglers. So now note that whenever D is uh, greater than or equal to S plus one, that is when the degree of the polynomial is uh, uh, large, uh, one needs a multiplicative factor S overhead. So basically the second term uh, becomes the dominant uh, term. That will be the winning term. So for example, for tolerating one or two stragglers, even for degree two polynomials, one needs 100% or in the case of two stragglers two, 100% more overhead. This is a significantly high overhead and might even be prohibitive in many scenarios. Rashmi, I have a quick question. So here, yes. the polynomial is the polynomial you're using for the coding, meaning the, your, the evaluation of this polynomial or the function is a polynomial function you're trying to evaluate? The function is a polynomial. Okay. So the algebraic approaches, uh, uh, currently the existing algebraic approaches are applicable uh, only to uh, polynomials in the sense that the most general yeah. class of nonlinear functions that they are applicable for is polynomials. And can you comment more on this minimum number of workers? So uh, what, what, are, what do these two quantities represent? Yes, so the, so uh, very nice question. So the second quantity, if you stare at it a little bit is basically replication. So in order to uh. tolerate S stragglers, uh, so in, in this case, k times s plus one is basically, in addition to the k input points, uh, k workers that you would have used, you're adding k times s more, right? So that's just plain replication. And the, and the first term is the more the non-trivial term. And in fact, we will get to this later in the talk because the locality-based approach that I am going to present uh, gives an, you know, uh, an intuitive way of looking at this and where this term comes from. So here, do you assume that you don't, you don't uh, take into account the amount of computation you give to the worker because in replication could be, you're not splitting the task, right? Or, or in both cases, you're giving the then, same. So yes, yes. so in, even in the replication, it is splitting in the sense that the, the setup is that it is distributed in the sense that each worker computes F on one of the input points. Okay. So, so in the replication scenario, you have x1 to xk given to k workers. And then similarly, you know, so you have k times s plus one workers and each one of them are given just one input point. Okay. Okay, cool. Yeah. So now, uh, so this amount of overhead uh, might even be prohibitive in, in many scenarios. So the key question here is, is this high resource overhead inevitable for nonlinear functions. Yeah. So in chasing this question uh, towards this, we propose a new approach to model coded computation via the lens of uh, locality of codes. Uh, a quick slide on setting and notation here. So for simplicity, I'll be focusing on coded computation for functions over finite vector spaces. And let capital F denote a class of functions between finite vector spaces V and U. And let V, which is the domain of the function, consists of points V1 to Vn. 
and let the small f be the function that we are interested in, which comes from this class of functions. So there are three key ingredients to this locality-based approach, uh, and I'll present one by one. The first ingredient is looking at functions as code words. So what do I mean by that? So recall that this function f is what we are interested in, and this has a domain v, which consists of points v1 to vn. So evaluation of this function f on all the points in the domain is basically this uh, set of n values, right? So f of v1 to f of vn. Now this is an n length vector. View this as a code word, okay? So, so we call this code word associated to a function f as its associated uh, code word, cf. Now an associated code, now for the function class, is set of code words for all functions in this class. Let's take an example. So let's take this function class as multivariate polynomials of total degree at most d. Now for a function in this class, its associated code word is going to be evaluation of that function, which will be a polynomial. So evaluation of that polynomial at all points in the domain. Right? And the associated code is going to be the collection of all such code words, which is basically collection of code words for all multivariate polynomials of total degree at most D. So Rashmi, and, here yes? you, have, you have a kind of limit on the number of variables, right? So. Uh, so, sorry, what variables? Uh, uh, I mean, this looks to me like a Reed Miller code, but. Uh... Yeah, exactly, yes, this is oh, a Reed Miller okay. code. <laughs> yeah, it's a good comment. So, this okay. is nothing but the Reed Miller code, right? So, basically, the associated code for this cl function class of multivariate polynomials of total degree d is the Reed Miller code. Okay, so, so this is what the associated code word and the associated code corresponds to. So now the second ingredient is uh, what we will call as computational locality of function classes. So now for a function class F, so we will call it as having computational locality L if every set of K code symbols in any code word in the associated code can be decoded from a subset of other code symbols of size L. Okay, that is there exists a subset of other code symbols of size L where any L minus S symbols are sufficient to decode. So basically this S is what is going to provide the Stagler resistor. So pictorially to look at this, so let's consider this associated code word for this function F in this function class. So this is a vector of length N uh, f of v1 to f of vn. Right? So let's let's say the k code symbols that we are looking at currently is this f of vi1 to f of vik. So now if this function class has computational locality L, then there exists L code symbols such that any L minus S subset of those symbols are sufficient to decode these original K symbols. Okay, so now how does this notion of computational locality relates to coded computation? So suppose the input points were VI1 to VIK. That is the goal is to compute F of VI1 to F of VIK. Yes. Uh, are you looking for the largest L or the smallest L, uh, you know, in the subset size? So the smallest, smallest such L that holds for all the associated code words in the code, okay. in the sense that uh, if we look at the class of, let's say, multivariate polynomials, then it should hold for all polynomials. Okay. Good. Yeah. So, so we were looking at this connection of between computational locality and coded computation. So suppose the input points were VI1 to VIK. That is, we're interested in computing F of VI1 to F of VIK. So then what one should do is get L workers to compute F on inputs 
V J one to V J K, right? So these this other set of code symbols that we saw, and as we saw, L, any L minus S of, of it is going to be sufficient to decode this uh, original K. So that is going to provide the S straggler resistance, and this decoding is going to happen via generalized local recovery algorithms of the associated code. So these local recovery algorithms are basically algorithms to recover uh, a subset or a small set of erased code symbols using a small set of other uh, code symbols. And I'm referring to uh, a generalized version of these algorithms. Uh, and this is a straightforward generalization, which I will uh, get to soon. So this is not it. Uh, so there is one missing link. So coded computation schemes uh, also allow replication. And as we saw uh, in one of the slides earlier that replication is a valid way of adding redundancy, right? That is giving the same input to multiple coworkers, the multiple workers. But so far, the way we have defined associated code word prohibits replication. So the third ingredient is just to add repetitions within the associated code word. So now the repeated code word is going to look like this. So previously we had f of v1 to f of vn as the code word associated to a function f. Now you would have s plus one times repetitions of that vector. So now this is going to be the repeated version of the code word. I recall that this S parameter refers to the desired straggler tolerance. So, uh, okay. Rashmi, this is Arya. Can I ask a question? Yeah, yeah, yes, sir. Yeah. Um, so, uh, the functions that you want to compute in this distributed manner, mm -hmm. uh, think of them uh, as functions over some finite field, or should I think of them as some real function like in real machine learning? Yeah, so that's a good question. So what I'm presenting today uh, in the talk, so for simplicity, I'm keeping it uh, from finite vector spaces, uh, but most of these hold for infinite spaces as well. Uh, so in, in the sense that the more details are present in the archive paper, but today I will be not in the talk, I'll not be going into that. I see. Okay, thanks. Okay, cool. So basically now, so recall that the third ingredient was to add repetitions to this uh, associated code word. And we will carry this repetitions into the associated code now, which would just be considering all such repeated uh, associated code words for all the functions in that function class. And now the definition of computational locality remains the same with a slight modification that instead of looking at the associated code, now we will be looking at this repeated version. Uh, just one thing to keep in mind is that uh, this does not mean that you would necessarily add repetitions into the coded computation scheme. So this is just the abstraction. Uh, this just so that the model allows for repetitions uh, to be provided. Okay. So now the key result is the following, and this is the connection between this computational locality and coded computation stated informally here is that the minimum number of workers needed to perform a straggler resistant computation for a function is equal to the computational locality of the function class. Okay, so now uh, what is the utility of this locality based model? First of all, uh, this locality is yeah. Sorry to interrupt. We keep no, it. Yeah, no, go ahead. Yeah, but I think it makes, yeah, it, it makes it more interactive. Uh, yes, yes. Then I would love to keep it interactive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. please go ahead. So, uh, the previous statement, I'm sure you're going to explain it more, but is this only for linear? Because if you're doing, I mean, in my mind, I'm thinking if you're evaluating functions that are polynomial, how, how come the degree is not going to kill some of the redundant? So is this for linear? No, no. So, so what do you, what do you mean by for linear? So you mean are you ask, asking about the, if the function is linear? Yeah, the function that you're trying. No, 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 no. But, right. So, so the so the definition of uh, the associated code word, the associated code, and the computational locality uh, was uh, had nothing to do with linearity. Okay. Okay. So maybe what maybe if later on. Yes. So actually, so I do have an example, and and I hope uh, I will have some time to get to it. 
Okay. But maybe that will make it clear. Okay, sure. But uh, just a, a, a short answer to your question is no, linearity is not needed. It is applicable for any uh, functions, even for polynomials. Like, okay. Because the, the goal here was to look at the nonlinear functions. Right? For linear functions, uh, any linear erasure code suffices. OK, so uh, the utility of locality-based model. So first of all, uh, this locality-based uh, model connects coded computation to the lit literature in the area of locality of codes and, lo and their local recovery schemes. So this model uh, basically provides a way of translating local recovery schemes of codes into coded computation schemes. Uh, secondly, uh, this provides an intuitive interpretation of existing coded computation schemes. And I'll take an example uh, to show this. So let's again go with this example of multivariate polynomials as the function class. Uh, so f is this multivariate polynomials of total degree d, this function class that we looked at earlier. Uh, recall from the informal theorem that the minimum number of workers needed is going to be the computational locality of multivariate polynomials. Now, computational locality, you know, is related to the associated code. And as we saw, the associated code here is the Reed-Muller code, right? So basically now all we have to look at is local recovery schemes for the Reed-Muller code. So for local recovery scheme of Reed-Muller code, so let's start with uh, considering recovery of a single code symbol. And it's, it's best uh, shown with an example. So let's say we want to compute F, uh, which is XQ, and just at one point at X1, okay? So in doing this, local recovery of f at this point x1, one passes a line through x1, and let's represent it by r of y, which is shown in the second subplot, which is uh, the middle plot here at the bottom of the slide. And then now if we look at f of r of y, this is going to be a univariate polynomial of degree at most d. Uh, in which case, uh, uh, you know, so in, this, in general, when the, when the degree of f is uh, at most d. So this is, a, and this is shown for this particular example on the right more, rightmost plot at the bottom of the slide. So this f of r of y uh, will be such that one of this evaluation points would be the out desired output. So now, as you can see, what one could do is compute b plus s plus one evaluations of this f of r of y and interpolate with any d plus one of them. So this is the straightforward uh, local recovery scheme of Reed-Muller codes from the literature. So now in coded computation, we would need a slight, very straightforward generalization of this, basically looking at local recovery at k points instead of one point. So the approach uh, proceeds in an exactly similar way as in the previous slide. I will not go into the details. But basically, now instead of d plus s plus one, we have k minus one times d plus s plus one. And using this, we can arrive at the fact that this function class, which is this function class of multivariate polynomials of degree at most d, has the computational locality as shown here, which is the min between these two entities, uh, which is precisely the same uh, expression that we had seen earlier uh, in the talk. So using local recovery schemes for Reed-Muller code, so we can arrive at the coded computation scheme of for multivariate polynomials. And this uh, reproduces the Lagrange coded computation scheme uh, by U et al. And uh, at least we think that this provides an intuitive interpretation uh, via the lens of locality of Reed-Muller codes as to why the scheme works. Okay, and uh, so far though, the problem of the overhead of the required number of workers still remains, right? Uh, and as we saw, so this required number of workers is related to, and it's exactly the same as the lower bound that we saw earlier. So in order to make the number of the overhead lesser, so we will have to change the setup in some way, right? So this locality-based approach provides a principled approach for doing this, that is, you know, what to change in the setup. And the key intuition here is the following. 
The existing schemes are based on computational locality that is induced by the function. For example, we saw uh, how the computational locality induced by this function class of multivariate polynomials can be used. Right? But however, now given this general understanding of uh, how computational locality helps for Courier computation, we can leverage computational locality induced by other aspects. For example, locality induced by inputs, locality induced by outputs, and so on. So I'll not have the time to go into the details of this, but just to take one example. Uh, so what I mean by taking, leveraging locality induced by inputs is the linear dependencies among the inputs. So linear dependencies among inputs arise naturally in many scenarios, and I, I will get to this in a minute. But in this scenario, let's say when there are D points that are linearly dependent, then coded computation via the locality-based approach reduces the number of workers needed by a factor of D minus one over D. And this factor can be substantial when there are sparse linear dependencies. For example, when D equal to three, this is, uh, reduces the number of workers needed by a factor two over three. Now you might be thinking that, wait a minute, this however requires some computational cost in identifying the linear dependencies among the inputs, right? So one of the key observations is that actually, while it, it is true that you need computational cost to identify linear dependencies, in several applications, this can be obtained with negligible additional cost. For example, in many applications, linear dependencies among the inputs are known in advance. For example, uh, if one is performing machine learning training with uh, what is called as, as a mix-up, which adds linear combinations of the data points uh, as a way of data augmentation into the data points. So this linear dependencies is known in advance. Uh, and similarly, in another class of applications, one could reuse these linear dependencies with a one-time amortized cost. Uh, for example, if the computations are such that there are multiple rounds of computations on same data points, uh, one example could be ML training with the gradient descent, or linear dependencies for publicly available data sets can also be reused uh, by computing them just once. Okay, so in conclusion, uh, coded computation is a promising approach for adding resilience to distributed computation against unavailability. Uh, however, a key challenge is handling nonlinear functions. Uh, so I presented a new approach to model coded computation via lens of locality of codes. Defined this notion of computational locality and explained how one can design coded computation schemes using local recovery algorithms for codes. The, they lead to an alternative, uh, an intuitive explanation of existing coded computation schemes and also allows one to design coded computation schemes with lower required number of workers than the current state of the art. Uh, thank you all for your attention and I'd be happy to take any questions. Yeah, thanks a lot, Rashmi. So I think we have time for one very quick question before we conclude the, the, this session. I think we asked you lots of questions. <laughs> True, yeah. Okay. So I think uh, this concludes uh, our session. I'm really happy for and thankful for all the speakers that joined us and gave five great talks. Uh, also, uh, Thank you for everyone who joined us here at Zoom, on Zoom. And I saw also there were around 25 people watching live on YouTube. Thanks also to everyone. And uh, hopefully everyone will stay safe and healthy and we will be back to normal life very soon. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thank you, sir. Thank yeah, you. Thanks, thanks for, for yeah.